Welcome, everyone. Um, we've really been looking forward to this uh, webinar and this conversation with Gary Nabhan, who is the author of the Big Read book. We've many of us have been reading in March called Coming Home to Eat. And this is a part of our Eat Local um, project through the county library system. And more information about all the activities and resources in that project is available at eatlocalcochise.org. Um, before we uh, introduce Gary and get started, I just wanna go over a couple housekeeping details. Um, for this webinar, um, all of our participants are muted and the cameras are off. Um, you can use the Q&A function if you have questions that you wanna post for Gary and after, um, after he um, presents some, some information, then we'll have time for Q&A. Um, and then feel free to use the chat for any conversations or resources or comments that you wanna share with the whole group. Um, we will be sending a recording of this session out afterward along with any um, additional resources that are pertinent. Um, it is April 7th and it is National Library Week and we are really grateful for all of our libraries and their staffs. Um, in Cochise County, we have 12 public libraries and it is just such a phenomenal resource um, for our county. Um, and they do, they do so many great projects like this and other things. And so tonight we're joined by Amity Ricketts who is the director of our county library district. And she's going to introduce um, Gary, our presenter. Thank you, Karen, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, Gary Nabhan is an agricultural ecologist and ethnobotanist and the author of more than 20 books on local food and the biodiversity and cultural diversity of the Southwestern desert. He's a pioneer in both the local food and the heirloom seed saving movements and is a co-founder of Native Seeds Search. He currently lives in Patagonia and is on the faculty of the University of Arizona as a research social scientist, serving as the Kellogg Endowed Chair in Southwestern Borderlands Food and Water Security. He's the author of our March Big Read selection, Coming Home to Eat, and we're so happy to have him with us this evening. Thanks. Well, well thank you all. And uh, again, thank all of you who work in and support our library systems. Uh, I've fallen in love with uh, the work that teams at libraries do because of the uh, free seed library movement that uh, some of the branches in Cochise County and Pima County and where I am in Santa Cruz County have been among the first innovators in the whole country. And I, I just think that uh, libraries are the most important institution that we have, especially during times of COVID where we feel this isolation because they found ways to sponsor events that we can still all be part of. And of course we can all read. <laughs> so I'd like to um, say that um, it was about 20 years ago exactly uh, that I turned this book in um, right after we had um, a pilgrimage. It was one of the last chapters in the book walking up from the Gulf of California coast with uh, Native American youth uh, in a walk for uh, health, heritage and diabetes prevention. And just two weekends ago, six of those 18 some uh, then youth <laughs> uh, walked again with us for uh, a walk across the desert this time um, 35 kilometers in one direction and 25 kilometers in another to um, petition the Mexican government to help their villages get water and energy sources turned back on so that they could grow food, which has become key during the time of COVID. So the part of my job description that's about food security seems like an abstraction to some people that uh, yes, we know um, there are uh, people that are hungry in the world, but are there people that are hungry in the United States? And, and do we really need to pay this much attention 
intellectually and ethically to um, hunger, food security, and food sovereignty. And I think the COVID pandemic has shown that the kinds of networks that we've built over the last 20 years to have more local food uh, security are paying off. One in six Americans have suffered hunger or feared uh, that their families would become uh, vulnerable to prolonged food security. And our food banks, like the incredible ones that we have here in Arizona, um, nearly all of them have um, ramped up their services to uh, help six to 10 times as many people as they did before COVID. And part of the trouble is that when we're dependent on food from far away, some of our systems break down when there's something like a pandemic that we have truck drivers who are going into uh, uh, mini marts and becoming uh, vulnerable to uh, COVID positive people. We have farm workers, some of them who come across the border but don't have good health services on the other side of the border, um, having some of the highest rates of COVID in the United States. And of course, after New York City, uh, our neighbors on the Navajo reservation, the Diné Nation, uh, suffered the second highest rates of COVID in the country. And most of them are farmers and sheep herders and ranchers. So we've seen uh, the kinds of things that we began to worry about in depth 20 years ago that we needed more local food security um, really um, become a national issue. Um, and the other part of that is that our farmers and ranchers, because some of them had to kill off their stock or donated all to food banks, um, they're facing more depth than ever before and are expected to um, have $6 billion of um, added debt or income loss this next year. So um, this issue about local food security isn't a privilege that we have <laughs> to deal with. Um, it's a necessity now. And I'm so grateful for the thousands of Arizonans I've interacted with um, on these topics, especially the farmers and ranchers and food service workers and food bank people, because they've really changed the nature of the American discussion about these issues. And there, it's happening in every community, whether it's a, a, a Bisbee or a Patagonia or a Tucson or Phoenix. I, I have to say that my um, underlying reason for doing this book was to explore our region in a deeper way, something that many of your readers do virtually through the books they choose to read or through their own travels, even during the time of COVID, that many of us love to meet and see the, the people who bring us our daily bread. And when I moved back to southern east, southeastern Arizona 11 years ago, one of my real joys was um, heading out one week to see Dennis Maroney at uh, the 49 Ranch. Uh, uh, he and Deb live uh, just north of Bisbee, about 15 miles, and um, uh, on the edge of the Sulphur uh, Springs Valley, and I mean, San Simone Valley. And then um, the other farmers that are out there, um, including our our world famous chili man up uh, uh, closer to Wilcox. So you have unique farmers and ranchers in Cochise County and some of the most interesting organizations sponsoring farmers markets and uh, uh, food events like the mesquite flour millings uh, that are now happening in Cochise County as well as in our 
community of Patagonia where people gather up their mesquite pods and then we ha have a day where we all grind our, our pods on a, a hammer mill and, and then uh, sift them together and, and talk about how we can best use them in recipes. That kind of interest in wild and cultivated foods can happen everywhere in the US. Uh, Cochise County probably has a greater range of farm and ranch sizes and, and products than most counties in Arizona, far more than Santa Cruz County, of course, where we mostly have vineyards and, and some remaining cattle ranches of antiquity that we cherish, but uh, that you have pomegranates and um, pecans and pistachios uh, as well as many field crops, I think is to your credit. And uh, we, we are um, indebted not only to the current farmers, but the farmers that really settled Cochise County for a number of special crops. Uh, there are some um, yellow onions uh, that were grown in Cochise County for decades that are now really, they're uh, been slightly selected and most of those sweet yellow onions come from Texas now, but their origins are uh, Cochise County, the kinds of pomegranates and figs and mission almonds and quinces that the uh, Spanish settlers left among the indigenous tribes um, are being saved not only at my place, but at Mission Gardens in Tucson and at the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture uh, that um, plays a role out there, much like uh, the Baja Arizona um, BASA uh, program does in Cochise County. <clears throat> and I have to say that I did part of my master's thesis on dry beans. I focused on tepary beans, bringing them back into cultivation. But uh, I did my field work at an experimental farm in Hereford and at another one uh, uh, closer to Wilcox uh, in the 1970s. And at that time, there were dozens and dozens of uh, varieties of dry beans grown in Cochise County. And then within a few years, of course, uh, water issues, water scarcity issues, and, and pumping depth issue and competition for water began to be the important concerns that they re remain today in Cochise County. Some uh, newspaper articles the last three years have claimed that Cochise County is suffering from water wars. And I don't like the word wars, but it's probably important that Cochise County residents realize that uh, fresh water is a finite resource that um, we can't take for granted. Uh, there's over 500,000 acres of abandoned agricultural lands in Southern Arizona and adjacent Sonora <coughs> that are uh, abandoned or full of tumbleweeds now because of over pumping of groundwater. And so that's a very, very real issue. The other thing I wanna say about the book that is not so much a, uh, um, an academic or technical issue is that I'm a hedonist. I was really in it for the pleasures <laughs> of trying out so many unique flavors and fragrances and textures like uh, Choya cactus flower buds and mesquite pods made into uh, smoky, savory tortillas and um, trying out the many different kinds of fish that come to us from the Gulf of California and um, learning about uh, Criollo Coriani cattle like the uh, Criollo cattle that Dennis and Deb Maroney grow on their ranch. At that time, I was growing Navajo churro sheep, which they also grow. And these are rare breeds that are 
finely adapted to desert conditions that have a place not only in our past, but in our future. And besides that, they have such distinctive tastes. Uh, churro sheep is still my favorite kind of meat. When I do eat meat, I usually fast from meat during Lent and on, on meatless Fridays. Um, it's something that uh, Slow Food USA uh, requests even to people who do love um, grass-fed and, and antibiotic-free meats. And I, I think that because of their drought adaptations and heat adaptations, we're going to see more and more interest of them. They're not the kinds of things that the professors I got an ag degree from at University of Arizona uh, recommended that we study and that we <coughs> um, develop when I uh, went to ag school in Tucson in the 70s. And that's because water seemed limitless and cheap. And every time we call uh, a resource cheap, <laughs> we end up finding that once it's scarce, it is no longer cheap. <laughs> and that um, the, the poor and marginalized communities often lose out on having access to that. So um, I just saw a note from uh, um, our participants talking about uh, a local food day, like local library day. And at one point, we aim to get a holiday like Thanksgiving. Um, once a book came out, uh, in, uh, we worked with Slow Food and Chefs Collaborative, two national organizations, to have a harvest holiday each fall because Thanksgiving had veered so far away from giving thanks to our local farmers and ranchers and orchard keepers for their role in giving us our daily bread. And so at something like 20 cities around the United States, we had great American picnics that go along with uh, the great American uh, reeds, I guess, uh, to remind people that each region has unique foods that it's up to, to the people in that region to take care of. So part of the book was that personal quest of walking across the desert, seeing what was edible, learning from indigenous peoples of this region on both sides of the border, who still knew how to harvest and process those foods <clears throat> and learning from some of the great chefs that we have in the Southwest who've had uh, creativity and courage to bring these into uh, medium and high-end restaurants where such weird foods had never been tried. <laughs> and all of that has been an enormous success. Southern Arizona has more foods on the Slow Food USA, Arc of Taste of rare foods deserving uh, tradition and revival than any other place in the United States. And there are things that grow in Cochise, Pima, and Santa Cruz counties and adjacent Sonora. Things like the Sonoran pomegranates and, and uh, the tepary beans and chiltepines. So what that brings us back to is my final comment before we open it up to questions. And that's that each place in the United States has a distinctive terroir or taste of place that many of the great writers that all of us love who are from Arizona remind us of how unique a place we're living in, that you can't feel the same way that we get to feel on a gorgeous spring day and a, a beautiful sunset here, that people people in Boston or Portland or, or uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, or Fargo, North Dakota, um, don't get the pleasures and perhaps some of the pains <laughs> that we do by living in an arid landscape. But the additional thing that we get here is the distinctive taste of place. It's in the chemistry of the plants that we have. The taste of chilies are, is hotter the taste of oregano's and other spices is sharper. 
uh, the uh, many uh, terpenes and, and secondary chemicals that are that our cattle and sheep eat on the range here make them taste um, unlike the beef or lamb that is produced in other areas. Um, when we say grass-fed <laughs> uh, beef has a flavor, really it isn't the grasses that give them that flavor. It's all the herbs that the cattle or, or uh, sheep or goats eat. So that's one of the benefits, uh, hedonistic sensory benefits that we love by investing time in local foods, either gathering themselves or honoring and supporting the farmers and ranchers and foragers that uh, do what we can't do. And I just need to say one last thing about that, that when I actually totaled up all the hours that I spent in that year of eating within 250 kilometers of where I lived, I spent less time foraging and processing the desert foods and the things from our garden than I would have if I had bought all my food from the grocery store 25 miles away. I lived in Three Points at the time that I wrote the book, which is about as uh, uh, far away as Tombstone is from Sierra Vista or, or uh, Douglas. So the, the, the point is that um, it takes no more effort, no more time, and probably far less gas or other form of energy to eat more locally than it does to, to buy our, our, uh, all our food from stores. And what we get from that is not just great food, but the pleasure and health benefits of being in contact with the soil, of being uh, in synchrony with the seasons, of being in love with the food traditions of our region and feeling the joy and exuberance of sharing with our friends a great meal that came from just outside our kitchen door. So with that, I'd like to open this up to questions or comments. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, so much, so much good information and lots of spring words. I know we have a couple questions in the um, from participants, and and definitely what you said um, brought some questions to my mind. Um, you talked about things you've learned over the years, and I know this was one of the really rich parts of the book that I appreciated. Um, things you've learned from our indigenous people. Um, can you talk more about that? Yes, I, I've been blessed by um, the welcoming attitude that um, a number of Native American communities have had to me and my wife. We're, we've been helping them with COVID response and food security issues on both sides of the border um, and really feel that in gratitude for all the, the foraging trips and agricultural uh, harvest that they've let us share in that, that we need to give back to them. But just a few examples um, of what I learned at a critical time where Native American agriculture was in steep decline. For instance, the Tahano Autumn Reservation in the 19, early 1930s before the Dust Bowl had over 50,000 acres of water harvesting fields at a time when we didn't even have a term like water harvesting, it was called day temporal or oxygen or, or uh, flood water agriculture. By the time I was born in the 50s, there was only 5,000 acres left out in their reservation, which is the size of Connecticut. And by the time I studied uh, their water harvesting fields for my dissertation, and 1980 to 1982, there were less than 50 acres left. And so I had the great gift, whether it's sad or wistful or, or just ironic, of apprenticing with some of the last traditional farmers of that 
4,000 year old tradition in Southern Arizona. Yeah, many of you know that we have the oldest agricultural fields in the archeological record of any place north of Mexico that uh, where Mission Gardens is seated uh, right below my office on Tumamac Hill. That's um, 4,400 years of, of corn cultivation there. Squash and beans came in soon after that. And we have some of the oldest irrigation systems in the Americas in the Tucson Basin. So to, to have the privilege, the blessing, the gift of working with farmers who knew the last vestiges of that tradition through their traditional ecological knowledge and oral history was something that to me is as priceless as anything else in my life, as much as my children or my, my dear friends. And it's because they were humble, but very observant people that drew not only on their own detailed observations of the weather and the plants and, and the soils, but on hundreds of years of other people's knowledge, their ancestors' knowledge that was distilled in stories and songs and sayings that guided them up until this day. There's a question about what kind of beans they taught me how to grow. <laughs> and as I said, the little white and brown tepary beans or what I chose to do my dissertation on, but we also um, saw in those fields and, and um, were gifted seeds that ended up in the native seeds collection that um, included the most delicious lima beans I've ever tasted. I hated white lima beans when I was a kid and the mottled lima beans are, some of the most delicious beans I've ever tasted, scarlet runner beans uh, and uh, common beans like pinot beans and sulfur azufrado beans. And then uh, Spanish introduced cow peas, lentils, fava beans, and uh, dry uh, peas uh, that you use as soup peas rather than as fresh vegetables. So the people in the Southwest from West Texas to Yuma were the bean eating as people in North America and maybe in the world. Only parts of India do people consume more legumes. And as we know now, or most of you probably know, legumes are really good for people suffering from diabetes or people wanting to prevent diabetes. And so I spent much of the 90s um, trying to learn which native foods could help prevent the emerging epidemic of adult onset diabetes. Now Mexico is the country in the world with the highest rates of diabetes and childhood obesity and the Southwest isn't too far behind. So there's a question in the chat about Anasazi beans and if they're good for us. They are, and uh, it's another bean that's in the prehistoric record, but it's very similar in appearance to um, an introduced bean that's also grown in the Southwest. Um, that's called Jacob's cattle bean that originally came from Chile to the East Coast, like some of our squashes did, and then uh, came out West with the wagons. And Anastasi beans, um, I'm proud to say when a company tried to not patent them, but trademark them up in Colorado. Um, I helped Native Seed Search file uh, uh, a, uh, an opinion that because it was a prehistoric bean that belonged to indigenous people, it should not be patented or copyrighted. Excellent. So we have a question about mesquite, but before we get to that, um, I'm remembering we've had a couple other webinars. Um, we had a couple book club discussions about your book, and then we had a session a couple weeks ago about um, growing food here. And the question came up about native versus non-native and what are the pros and cons, particularly as people are looking at planting their own gardens, um, what are the pros and cons of, of native planting native seeds, plants? Well, there's 
um, questions within questions there and answers within answers. So in general, um, we should be attentive to all the drought and heat adapted crops that we can find. And I did a in another book called Growing Food in a Hotter, Drier Land that came out about five years ago from Chelsea Greencrest. I put tables of both the annual crops and the fruit and nut trees that we should uh, uh, pay attention to whether they're native or whether they're introduced like a lot of the Spanish introduced um, introductions that were really from Morocco and Andalusia, Spain, pretty dry areas that have taken root well in here. And I, I think they have deep adaptations to arid climates just like the native things do. Um, we have to be uh, careful about cultural appropriation when we use the word native. So um, I, I am of Arab or Lebanese background and a lot of what I grow are, are either um, uh, things introduced from, from uh, the Middle East by my, my family. They brought them with them on the boat or I've gone back to Lebanon and gotten seeds of the same cucumbers and melons. Or I forage for equivalents like as many of you know, who've been in Middle Eastern restaurants, um, there's a lot of use of grape leaves and of spices like sumac and oregano and uh, thyme that are old world crops. But what I do here is use the native new world equivalents for the same thing. So you have three kinds of edible sumac berries in Cochise County, uh, alone that you can grind uh, just like the spice that's called simic or sumac uh, that they put on top of hummus and, and all of that. Um, grape leaves, you can stuff Arizona wild grape leaves just as easily as you can. Cultivated grape leaves are a little bit smaller, but they have great flavor. Uh, and I could go on, but you get the picture. Um, so we use Mexican oregano and it's not going to mix this instead of other things. And yes, uh, a salad that someone just mentioned. Uh, uh, I found out that my relatives use uh, barro or watercress in their fetush and uh, pomegranate syrup is the dressing. And so rather than uh, doing fetush with, um, with romaine lettuce leaves, many of my relatives do it with things that we have right here, portulaca or verdolagas and watercress. So, so every culture mixed it up. There wasn't like a, a, a joy of cooking manual that everyone um, used as a Bible. They were saying, well, a, a pinch here and a teaspoon of this. And if this is in season, why don't we substitute that in? So that's kind of what I do. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Lee, um, who is asking about um, an, an event he went to where there were some poignant statements from young people in the Native communities about the diabetes problems in their family. And he wonders if you know if the awareness of these health issues has resulted in more use of Native foods in those communities. Uh, yes, it has. And uh, some of your uh, listeners may have been at a mesquite event that Mark Apple, who's now in Bisbee, I believe, organized up at Benson a few years ago. And there were a couple um, Native American voices there saying that what motivated them to look at mesquite and other things was the rise in diabetes. And so the wonderful organization called uh, 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 Sanavir Co-op Farm, uh, just a quarter mile away from Sanavir Mission, um, uh, not only uh, grows a lot of those things, but does value-added products with uh, what are called slow-release foods uh, uh, that reduce blood sugar levels, mesquite, prickly pear, I could keep, uh, tepary beans, I could keep on naming things, are one of those, but that's one of the motivations 
that Sanavir Co-op Farm, Ramona Farms on the Gila Indian Reservation, uh, Tahanoa Atom Community Action, and Hopi and Zuni um, tribal health programs uh, promote as a way to reinforce or celebrate people's identities, as well as to uh, prevent or reduce the vulnerabilities to diabetes. So that's now 25 years in the making, some of these programs and some of them been very successful. Nevertheless, look at all the bad foods that are advertised for hundreds of minutes each day on TV and and it's still an uphill struggle against the, the triggers to diabetes and obesity here. Yeah. Um, Barbara is asking if you could talk a little bit more about mesquite. And I know that you, you could do a whole hour on mesquite. Um, she mentions particularly that ranchers in the USDA sometimes seem to consider it a pest. <clears throat> yeah, well, we could say that some people in the USDA we consider pests too, but, but I find goodwill in a lot of those guys who even don't like mesquite. So I'm not going to call them pests. The, the point is that um, ranchers in Cochise and Santa Cruz County inherited lands that had too much mesquite on it because of historic uh, overgrazing during years of drought. They had no option to buy feed like we did in 2010 to 2011 with alfalfa hay coming in from Minnesota and Nebraska all the way to Arizona. Uh, ranchers a century ago we had about a hundred times the, the stocking rates that we have on our ranches now and the current ranchers are still healing the damage done from that area in other words i i'm not saying that that uh that they're overgrazing today i'm saying that that they have to deal with historic overgrazing as a persistent problem and some of them have learned better than others how to deal with that problem. And yet, what I'm on a committee with um, uh, Flavia Den, who's one of Dennis's, Dennis and Deb's uh, uh, ranch mates, I guess you'd call her, fine uh, French livestock scientist. And she's finding that mesquite is critical to livestock survival in our climate. That um, in drought years the and drought seasons, most stock moves to eating more mesquite leaves and mesquite pods and using the shade of mesquite trees during the day and foraging more at night. And the Criollo cattle that Dennis will talk to you about actually forage more at night and spend a lot of the day sleeping under mesquites. When the rains come, if they come, they switch over to dozens of other herbs and grasses, but you know our droughts are getting longer and our, our wet season shorter. So mesquite is essential to the future of Southwest ranching if it's managed correctly. And if we value it, it has to be pruned, it has to be thinned, but it doesn't have to be exterminated with herbicides to be compatible with ranching. How about choya um, flower buds? Are they edible? And how about the the sort of spring buds versus the fruits of the choya later on in the year? Well, they better be edible because I ate them on Easter day in a in a salad. Uh, we picked them a lot last year at this time and dried them down. The the way I love to cook them is pit roasting them. And I've just made a new pie, fire pit for roasting agaves and choya buds that I can begin to use as of next season. But they're high in calcium and many minerals. They have a delicious flavor akin to uh, asparagus tips and artichoke hearts. And um, I'm in love with them. I mean, uh, uh, I, I just think they're one of the best uh, most delicious and interesting vegetables I've ever had. And that, um, that, you know, 
we got to, you know, Wallace Stegner, one of the greatest Western writers of all time, who I had the honor of taking a workshop from in Utah one time, said we needed to get over the color of green if we were going to live in the West. And I think we also need to get over the, the fear of thorniness and spininess, uh, that, that agaves and prickly pear and choya buds are going to be part of the agricultural future here. Why? Because they're four to six times more uh, water use efficient for the same amount of edible biomass as most of our annual crops. I, I mean, our uh, tree crops are and 10 times more water efficient than most of our annual crops that came from temperate or, or tropic climes. We can't afford not to think about them as future crops in this area. And, and 12 of us from both sides of the border did a paper last September that got a lot of news that was in Plants People Planet that um, about a climate friendly agriculture. And instead of thinking that it's just gonna be peppery beans or, or, uh, or uh, oregano, it looks at growing more sun sensitive crops under acacias, mesquite and other tree crops uh, using water harvesting and also growing crops under uh, solar panels uh, that need multiple harvest during the year. So agriculture in the future here is not gonna look like anything that we have in Cochise County today. And we're gonna have to adapt to it and find pleasure in it just as we had to adapt when I was a kid from uh, wonder bread to multigrain breads. It's not that big of a leap. We can make that kind of change in our diets. Uh, you know, uh, look at all the people that grew up on one kind of bad beer that are now drinking six or seven different kinds of draft beers that they never heard of before each month. And so our habits can change to more diversity. I love that analogy to other kinds of food and how we've adapted. So back to the choya, you're eating the flower buds or the or the buds of the yeah, new well, growth. Here in southern Arizona, we eat the flower buds of uh, the cane choya, the skinniest ones. Uh, well, no, you have tasajo, the a um, punchar buscular, the little skinny, skinny ones too. But but they're they're no thicker than your your index finger. Uh, they're not like the teddy bear choya in Tucson. But my Syrian Indian friends eat the fruits year round. It's one of the most stable crops that they have, and they eat I'd say fifty to a hundred pounds of choya fruit per family, and they're not sweet and uh, juicy like prickly pear fruit, but they're highly nutritious. And they, the ones down there kind of have a lemony agridulce flavor. So people eat both in the Southwest and Wendy Hodgson's uh, um, edible plants of the Sonoran Desert is the best guide to that. Okay. And those fruits are what you're roasting? We wrote, we steam, uh, pit roast or steam the flower buds. Okay. Just like you would steam asparagus or artichoke mm -hmm. hearts. Nice. Excellent. Um, I have another question from one of our book club groups, <clears throat> which was about the, in the book you talk about um, GMOs and BT corn and other genetic modifications. And, and they were wanting an update on What's going on with GMOs now and how, how is it affecting monarch butterfly populations currently? I know you've done a lot of work on that. Yes, so l let me just say for the record that I love plant breeding and I love the genetic tools that we have for diagnostics and fingerprinting like, you know, 23 and me and all of that. But I'm a conservative, not a not a uh, a uh, dogmatic. I'm a conservative about when genetic engineering is appropriate and when it's not. And the GMO corn that is now on 20 million acres in the United States has caused 
um, a resistance to um, Roundup Ready uh, corn and all that of corn earworm and, and all that and has failed farmers while giving them higher costs of production. So most corn farmers in the Midwest that adopted GMO corns are some of the farmers in the greatest debt of any farmers in the United States. It's been a failed piecemeal solution to their problems. And they do have real problems that I hope they get help from. I'm not anti-corn farmer. But the collateral damage, if we estimate the cost of trying to bring back 3 billion monarch butterflies that were wiped out of the Midwestern Corn Belt, the long-term cost spread over 30 years is probably more than what they gained in yields by growing GMO corn. So it was a Faustian bargain. They had temporarily higher yields for higher costs, but the environmental costs of wiping out the most beloved insect or butterfly, most beloved invertebrate other than crabs, or, you know, blue eating crabs or, or clams in, in the Americas is way too high. So I was part of a, a letter that was on the front page of New York Times that I helped recruit signatures from Canadians, Mexicans, and and uh, Americans, along with uh, the poet laureate of Mexico, Omero Arritis, and, and uh, David Suzuki, and um, our uh, beloved Canadian novelist, whose name I'm forgetting because I'm tired right now. Um, uh, just I, w all of the um, uh, environmental scientists and uh, writers about nature came together to ask the presidents and prime ministers of Mexico, Canada, and the US to ramp up butterfly protection. And it, it's been successful. And tens of thousands of people are growing milkweeds for butterflies now. And that's good, but we still have to reduce the acreage in GMO corn, or they're gonna to have to come up with another kind of corn to replace it because the collateral damage is greater than the benefits. And, and what can we as citizens do to help move that along? <clears throat> I, there's so many Arizonans who've already planted milkweed gardens and uh, I, my garden is a milkweed way station. I went through Cochise County all the way over to West Texas, up as far as Santa Fe and across the Colorado Plateau, collecting 12 kinds of milkweeds and, and co-authored the milkweeds of the Southwest. It's available online. And so you can see which ones are in Cochise County, which ones have available seeds, and now's a good time to plant them. And they really do help keep monarch, monarch butterflies in place. How about um, advocacy work on the GMO front? Mexico is taking a really hard stance on them. Their head of their National Science Foundation has not only worked on native corns and valued them, but she's also completely aware of the flaws of how that GMO corn, the BT resistant corn, as well as the Roundup Ready corn were made. And she thinks it's bad science. Um, as, as one of us joked at a meeting with some of the big companies, you guys should get a, a Nobel Prize for reductionism because, <laughs> because you perfected reductionism to a new fine art, but it didn't help farmers and it didn't help monarchs. So I spent three years writing about it. Our Make Way for Monarchs uh, website still has all the breaking news on that front. So if you can remember makewayformonarchs.org, we keep that website alive. And it was about five years of my life that was sunk into that effort. Great, good resource. We'll get that posted in the chat as well. So we have time just for, I think, a couple more questions. Um, we have seen through this Eat Local project, we've seen tremendous interest on the part of 
consumers and residents here in eating local, but it seems like it's really challenging for people. And I'm wondering um, what sorts of things can be done to make this more feasible. Yeah, so I would say that um, the old idea that we had before there were such great stores in Bisbee and Patagonia that, that had a, a better variety of things than we grew up with was food co-ops where people had buying clubs. And, um, you know, to, to get from Ramona Farms uh, 30 miles south of Phoenix, a hundred pound bag of tepary beans to share and not buy beans for another, you know, three, three or four months if each of each family got 20 pounds of that hundred pound bag, um, it'd be so cost effective to do this kind of thing. And um, with meat like uh, Deb and Dennis Maroney's goat lamb and, and um, beef, the real limiting factor isn't consumer interest, it's been um, processing because Cochise County has some of the few small scale processing plants in Arizona left, all the big ones are in Phoenix and they had terrible COVID outbreaks. So it's that's the bottleneck for that. But remember that we can eat meat in the snout to tail way that our grandparents did where they used every possible part of the animal rather than just hydrating off the, the leg of lamb and the lamb chop. So we need to, when, when people do choose to eat meat, they need to think about how they can go whole hog rather than just high grading a few cuts. And then the other thing is being creative about using pecans, pistachios, and, and uh, things like that in new ways. Like I grow 34 kinds of pomegranates and I'm making pomegranate syrups and vinegars that I use in salad dressings and and on my breakfast cereals and uh, mix with soda water rather than buying, uh, you know, commercial uh, uh, carbonated beverages. And, and so part of the trouble is that there are things available, but we aren't using them in the full range of ways that we could have pleasure of doing and all of that. And then finally policies uh, like Santa Cruz County tried to to stop me from making beverages um, in a small canning kitchen in my house and, and selling them in Tucson. And then Dennis reminded me there, that there's a law uh, placed by our wonderful state legislature that has seldom passed a law that doesn't get overturned because none of them know how to write laws. But, but this one says it is not illegal for anyone who has homegrown products to sell them to their neighbors and that the government has no reason to be involved in your kitchen any more than they need to know what's happening in your bedroom. <laughs> and so that's the only thing that our state legislature has ever passed that I, I agree with them on. And so we really have a lot of unexercised flexibility in selling or trading or bartering products with each other. And with that, I think I should probably just add, add, answer one more question and then uh, thank you all for being with us. Right. And just really quickly. So that law you're talking about, about selling food to neighbors, because we're definitely been exploring that a lot in Cochise County lately. That's a different than the cottage food law or that's what you're talking about? The cottage, <laughs> the food, cottage law. food law. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and when I came to this Santa Cruz County attorney and said, why uh, Why am I being stopped? Uh, do you know about this law? She said, you know what? Uh, we will not come to your place anymore and check uh, uh, that you are below the level. You're not, you know, a big seller. You're, you're going to sell locally. We should not be regulating you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The so, cottage food laws are good. They don't cover everything, but we'll get, a, um, do, we'll get that link. And we did get a link posted. So just last question, and we, we really appreciate your time. I know you need to scoot along. Um, what's, your, what's your biggest hope for the future of our local food systems 
and and where do you see leverage in getting there? I I think that um, like I mentioned in my book, Food for from the Radical Center, that we need food to bind us together to heal the divides in our communities between Republican and Democrat, between Christian and science-based thinking. Um, Faith-based groups do most of the food banks and soup kitchens in this country, and we need to invite them into the local food dialogue and not think it's all about better science. It's about values, not just science. And so we need everyone to come together uh, to do this. My latest book is called uh, Jesus for Farmers and Fishers, talking about the parables that Jesus told during one of the worst farming and food crises uh, that ever happened in the Middle East. We're in the second worst food and farm crisis in the United States right now. And we need to pay attention to it, but use that uh, vulnerability that we have now to restructure our food systems for more equity um, and food justice. And I pray that all of us can be involved with it and see food unite us rather than further divide us. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Gary. I know um, all of our participants um, appreciate you being here and thank you. And um, I did post, check it, Food from the Radical Center is a great read. So definitely people check that out. Thank you, Gary. You are, if any of you come to Patagonia, look us up and we'll show you our, our garden and orchard. So best wishes to you all. I love you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So before we sign off, I just want to um, share some of our upcoming events. Um, we have just announced um, another round of webinars. Um, on the 21st, we're going to be doing a session about local food sources, including farmers markets, restaurants, other kinds of markets, and direct farm sales within the county. Um, we have a session after that on cooking with fresh vegetables, one on preserving food. Um, I mentioned in the chat desert foraging with the um, BASA people, which will include some information about mesquite. And then um, Dennis Maroney, as well as Eric Hess are going to be joining us for a session on raising local livestock. Um, in June, we're going to be having another big read and that it will be Animal Vegetable Miracle by Barbara Kingsolver. And then we'll have another um, pop-up book discussion of that. So lots of good things coming up. Um, there are many books, a lot of the things that were mentioned on this session, as well as just tons of other books on gardening, foraging, cooking, books for kids um, available through our library system. We also have um, an e-book and magazine, electronic magazine collection available at cochiselibrary.org. Um, and lastly, um, reach out to us and stay in touch if you have questions. Um, you can email us at info at eatlocalcochise.org. We are always posting resources um, on our website as well as on Facebook and Instagram. Facebook is probably the best place to sort of stay up on what's going on day to day. Um, and we would love to hear from you. Um, we've had, like I said, just tremendous interest in this project and we've, we've really appreciated the, the interest and the conversations we've started to have and, and really have come up with a couple ideas for some ongoing work in this area um, through sessions like this. So we appreciate that. And with that, um, I will say good night. Again, we will be posting um, a recording of this in the next day or two. And I will also get out a list of resources that were mentioned in the chat. So web links and books and other things. And if there are other, um, other things you have questions about or requests for uh, webinars or other resources, let us know. There's an evaluation that we'll, we'll put in the chat, but it'll also pop up when you sign off of Zoom. And we would love to get your input. And that also, um, that evaluation data is helpful to our funders. So thank you again all for being here and thank you to our libraries on National Library Week and we will look forward to seeing you on a future session. Thanks everybody.